Hello and welcome to the City Church. Uh, it's really great to have you here this morning uh, to join us on our Sunday service. If you're a regular, welcome back and it's great to see you. And if you're a new person, it's great to see you as well. Wherever you've come from, we're really glad that you could join us here this morning. As a church, we want to make sure that we are prioritising people. And one of the ways we can do that is through prayer. We have so many people behind the scenes ready to pray for you specifically. So if you have any need whatsoever, uh, please let us know and share with us your needs and concerns at the moment. We would love to pray for you. Also, if you want to connect more, we have a comment section. Please get in, send a joke, uh, say hello, do whatever you want. But we would love for you to join in the comment section and to join us as a church family. I'm going to pray for us before we start. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are with us individually in our homes, no matter where we are. We thank you that you want to meet with us this morning, that you want us to share something with us that is new of you. God, we pray that through, uh, whether it's the worship, whether it is through the sermon, or whether it's through the times of prayer, God, would you meet with us and show us something of you this morning that we didn't know before? Or whether it's to remind us something, God, just meet with us, we pray. Amen. I'm now going to hand over uh, to our amazing band and hand over to Ollie, uh, who's going to lead us in some song worship. Well, good morning, City Church. My name is Ollie. Real pleasure to be able to lead our time of praise this morning. I don't know how you're feeling this morning. Maybe you're feeling on top of the world, full of faith, or maybe you're feeling just a little bit lonely or a little bit fed up. Um, God's grace extends to you no matter how you feel this morning, because his grace extends to you for what he's done on the cross through Jesus. Let me read out a couple of verses from Titus 3 to encourage us. Talks about where we once were, talks about our foolishness and following the ways of this world. And then it says this, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're recipients of his grace. He's shown us his grace. It's amazing. And this grace will go on forever. So as we praise this morning, let's remember his beautiful grace. Let's remember his wonderful grace. And let's remember that grace that leads us to eternal life. All of my sin, your love. 
grace extends to us.
amazing hope we know his amazing grace he's the one we come to when we feel weary when we feel weak we know that in him we can come and the weak can be strengthened because of his grace
forever you are the one 
who satisfies me. You're my great hope. Jesus, we hope in you. We hope in your grace. We hope in your love. We hope in eternal life. That amazing time where we see you face to face. Jesus, help us know that hope in our hearts day to day. In your name, amen. Amen. Hi City Church, it's Liv here and I'm here to talk to you about my experiences with Alpha. A few years ago I came to Canterbury to start at university and I was lucky enough to be put in a house with a friend who um, was a Christian. I'd never met any Christians really before up until this point and I had no idea what Christianity was about. I had obviously big questions that I really wanted the answers to, but I never really felt like I had someone that I could share those questions with. My friend then said to me, oh, I've got, um, there's, a, there's an Alpha course going, do you want to come? And I thought, I have no idea what Alpha is. I'd never heard of it, never um, known anyone who'd done it before. Like I said, I didn't have any Christian friends or family members. And um, she dragged me along on the premise of that I got to have some free food. Um, so we turned up and it was really um, just very casual. Everyone was so welcoming and was so happy that I arrived. And I sort of, because I hadn't been around Christians before, I didn't really understand why they were so welcoming to me because we live in, a, in an environment where people are very quick. They're always in a rush and they were happy for me to be there. And they got to know me. They learned my name. They learned what course I was doing, where I came from, and they actually really wanted to learn and know about my story. And that felt amazing that people actually wanted to know about me. Um, so we, we went every week, it was on a Wednesday, and I just became friends with the people that were there. And like I said, I didn't have any expectation about what an alpha evening would look like. So I just turned up and just sort of went with it really. Um, so the format that it was when I was there was that we would share a meal together and that was just a really nice unhurried time to just get to know people and then we would um, watch a video and that video would have different topics each week and those topics were some of them were quite um, difficult topics and then we would go through questions and discussion points together and I think because we the, the group that were there at the time and the people that ran it were so welcoming and had spent the time getting to know me that actually they they made me feel comfortable right away and actually because I had big questions about Christianity I felt like I could ask them in a really non-judgmental way I think as there's different views of Christianity and like I said I hadn't had any any models in my life who were Christian so I felt like I could turn up every week and I used to make notes about different things I'd thought of during that week. Oh, I want to know this, I want to know that. And I would turn up and I would ask those questions. And never did I feel like I'd offended anyone. I never felt that um, I was asking maybe too challenging a question. The people that ran it were just so happy that I was there to start with and were so happy that um, I was asking those questions. Um, and I would just encourage if anyone is feeling like they have got big questions about Christianity, just go to Alpha, ask a friend, ask a family member about an Alpha course and it will just change your life. And it was just massively part of my story of how I became a Christian because I had that time, that non-judgmental time of just asking questions that I really wanted to know the answers to. And um, yeah, I just really encourage anyone who um, has those questions to just go and ask for more help.
Well, good morning and welcome to the City Church Online Experience. I do hope that you have been blessed already by what's been going on. And as we come to the Word of God, that each one of us, no matter what our story is, no matter what we believe, that each one of us would encounter Jesus through the Bible this morning. Today, we continue our Simply Jesus series where we are just really wanting to walk through the Gospel of Mark and see what we can learn about Jesus Christ himself. The man, he, he's not just an idea. Uh, he's not just a principle that we should stand by. He was a person that lived then and we believe lives now and that wants to come and meet with each one of us by his Holy Spirit. And so let's read together from Mark chapter 2 from verse 13. When he, Jesus, went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to him, why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins, but the new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, he, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of presence, which is which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. We see in this section of the scripture, three stories that seem completely separate. Jesus calls Levi to follow him, the tax collector. Then Jesus talks to John's disciples about fasting. And then Jesus talks to some other people about the Sabbath. They seem totally separate. And the way Mark writes his gospel, it does feel very much like there isn't a chronological order. There's just this and then this and then this. And they don't quite match. But actually, I do think as we look through these three stories, there is a common thread that today I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about. And the common thread is this, that Jesus is not interested in the external acts that are going on around us. And I want to show you how I've come to that conclusion from these three stories. So let's start with the first one. We see that Jesus meets a guy called Levi who's in the tax booth and he calls him to follow him. He then reclining at the table in a house and there's other tax collectors and sinners there and people, particularly the religious leaders, are offended by the fact Jesus is doing this. Why on earth would you spend time with them? And Jesus says to them, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous, I came for the sinners. There's a fascinating dynamic at play here, which is this, the religious leaders had put all of their emphasis on their external act. By what they looked like on the outside defined how God viewed them. And so you were righteous if you lived a righteous life. You were righteous if you didn't do certain things and you did do other things. And you were a sinner, you were unrighteous if you did do certain things. So for example, the tax collectors, they were definitely unrighteous. They were perhaps the lowest of the low of society at the time, particularly in the Jewish culture. Because you see, Levi was a Jew. This man, Levi, that Jesus calls to follow him, he was a Jewish man. But rather than siding with the Jewish people, Levi had become a tax collector. He'd taken the side of the Romans. He was collecting the money from the Jewish people to give to the Romans. Now that's bad enough. Almost he's a traitor is the way they would have seen him. But even worse than that, he was also a cheat 
because he wouldn't just take the money that was needed to pay the Romans tax, he would take more from the people for himself. He would make them pay more tax than they needed to so that he could have that money. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if there was someone doing that now, I would be um, indignant at the injustice and the way that they're acting. How outrageous that they would be stealing, they would be robbing, they would be cheating people of their money. That's what Levi was doing. And yet Jesus calls him to follow him. Whilst he's in the tax booth, while he sat around all of the money that he's stolen from other people, Jesus comes and calls him. And people are just shocked by this. They can't believe it. You would call that guy and then you would go and eat with other people like him. This is outrageous. And Jesus makes the point. He says to them, actually, listen, God isn't drawn to your external acts. He's not drawn to how kind you are to your neighbours. Ultimately, he's not drawn to how much money you give to charity. He's not impressed by, um, you know, how kind you are to people around you. God sees right to the heart. And the reality is, right at the heart, we all have the same issue, which is the issue of sin. That's why Jesus says at the end, this, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous, I came for the sinners. Because the reality is, there were no healthy or righteous people before God. Outside of Christ, we are all in the same situation, which is our hearts have grown sick because of sin. Because of our rebellion against God, our hearts now do not desire to please God. Our hearts run after other things. We turn other things into gods. We worship other things. Everyone is a worshipper, but the reality is not many of us are worshippers of God. We're worshippers of money, worshippers of power, worshippers of fame, worshippers of sex. We, we get drawn to those things rather than to God himself. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I came because no matter what you look like on the external, internally, we all face the same issue. We all need healing we all need saving. And so I want to say two things on this. The first is I want to speak to the Christians. I want to speak to the church. There is a danger for us that we can read this story and we can think, yep, God has come for the sinners and for the sick. God, go and find them. God, go and help them. God, use me to be able to do that. Now, that is true, but we've got to start by understanding that we were sick and sinners. That we weren't impressive that there's nothing to us that meant that God looked and went, wow, they really need to be on my team because with them on my team, they'll be phenomenal. I've just finished watching The Last Dance. This is a documentary on Netflix about the Chicago Bulls of the late 80s and 90s with Michael Jordan. He is phenomenal. And I wonder how many of us watch uh, stories like that of great people that have achieved great things and thought, yep, I'm like that. I could achieve great things. I'm basically the Michael Jordan of Jesus's team. With me, we're able to win everything rather than realizing that Jesus is the great one, is the good one, is the perfect one. The rest of us are incredibly flawed. And so we needed rescuing. I think if you've been a Christian for a while, you can start to forget how much rescuing you needed. You can start to believe the lie that actually, no, you, you, you weren't as bad as that. You're not as bad as other people. Actually, God brought you into the church because you were pretty much there anyway. No, no, Jesus did it all. Friends, today, if you're a Christian, I wanna encourage you, go back to remembering what Christ has done for you. Take time to reflect on how Jesus has transformed and changed your life. Don't believe for a second that any of the success or the maturity or the growth or the fruitfulness in your life is because of you. The Bible tells us it's because of Jesus and his spirit at work in us. A Christian is no different to someone that isn't a Christian, apart from the fact that Jesus has saved them and has put his spirit in them and is at work in them. That's what sets us apart, is Jesus himself, not us. So we need to be careful when we read stories like this that we don't harden our hearts and look at others in a certain way and look at ourselves in a different way, putting ourselves on a pedestal, looking at ourselves with a rose-tinted lens. To actually understand that we were sinners. We were sick, and by God's grace, we now know life, liberty, freedom, joy, acceptance, completely and utterly because of Jesus. But also if you're connecting in with us this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, then the Bible tells us that, again, all of us are those that need rescuing, need healing. Our hearts are sick. We long after things that we shouldn't long after. We're not drawn to God. We're, we're, we're drawn to other things that, that pull us away from God. Jesus wants to draw you to himself today. Jesus wants to come and sit with you. 
He doesn't judge Levi. I love it. He, he literally sees him in the tax booth surrounded by all of this money that he's stolen from other people. And Jesus says, follow me. It says immediately he followed him. Mark's favorite word. But then we see that then it says he's reclining at the table. Can I say this? Following Jesus ultimately is about relationship. I think sometimes we can think that following Jesus is about then um, works. You know, it's like you follow Jesus and then you've got to live a certain way. You've got to follow these rules and do these things. Now, actually, what we see here is following Jesus means you can recline at the table with Jesus. You can be at peace with him. You can enjoy a relationship with him. You can genuinely know that you are loved by him. The perfect God loves us if we place our trust in Christ. We're covered in him. We're accepted and welcomed. That's the invitation. That's the gospel message that you can know friendship with God. Come and recline at the table with Jesus. Consider, would you rather be an enemy of God or a friend of God? They're the choices, the Bible says. There's no in between. You're either someone that's reclining at the table with Jesus or you're not. We're either those that are are judging and, and our hearts are hardened and we're pulled away from God or we're those that are able to be drawn to God, is what the Bible tells us. Let me see this next part of the story is then Jesus comes into contact with some of John's disciples. This is John the Baptist his disciples. At this point, John has already died. And so the disciples are coming and they're looking and they're thinking, man, this doesn't quite make sense in terms of what's going on. We are those that are, you know, there's certain expectations of of the people of God. And one of them is that we're those that we fast at points. You know, there's feasting moments, but there's also fasting moments. We're watching you, Jesus, and your disciples, and there's, there's no fasting. And Jesus brings this fascinating kind of response where he talks about, well, when the bridegroom's there, would you fast? You know, if you're at a wedding, Would you fast on that day? That would be quite a strange day to choose to fast. I'm not going to eat today, but I'm still going to go to the wedding. Normally, that's a day of celebration, a day of joy. And so it's marked with feasting. And again, Jesus wanted to emphasize here that actually there is a dynamic at work where just simply the external act of fasting doesn't mean that you find approval from God or God will hear your prayers more. It's more about the internal heart. Some of us, I think we view fasting as like, this is for me to prove to God that I'm serious. God, I really love you. And God, I really want to see change. And I'm going to prove that by fasting. I'm not going to eat anything just to impress you, God. Look how holy I am. Look how committed I am and dedicated to you I am. Can you answer my prayer now? It's actually what Jesus is wanting to emphasize here is, again, it's about the internal. That fasting should be something that, that is, is a, comes from a heart longing of dissatisfaction. That there are things we want to see happen. And Jesus was saying at the moment that he was on this earth and the disciples were with him, there was no dissatisfaction in their heart because they were with Jesus. They were seeing Jesus at work. They were talking to Jesus. They were close to Jesus. They were watching the kingdom of God increase every single day. But Jesus was saying there will come a time where I'm going to I'm not going to be here. I'm going to ascend to heaven. And, and then until the day he returns, there will be this longing in our hearts for God to move. And so that's why then he talks about, you can't just go back to the old ways. I've started a new thing. And the new thing is about the heart. Friends, if you're a Christian, God cares about your heart. If you're not a Christian, God cares about your heart. He's not assessing our days. He's not looking on on my day and thinking, okay, well, today Martin's done pretty well. Externally, he's he's not sworn. Uh, He's not shouted at his kids. He's been patient. He's read his Bible. I even heard him pray a quick prayer. He's looking after himself physically. All of the, wow, you know, today I need to answer all of his prayers because he's done brilliantly. God looks at the heart. God cares about our heart connection to him. God cares about what's going on in us. And so Jesus is emphasizing here, listen, fasting needs to be a, a cry from the heart. It needs to be something that comes from this, this longing for more of God. And so fasting is connected to, to sorrow, really, is what we see here. Jesus is saying when the bridegroom's there, it's joy, there's connectivity, there's togetherness. Fasting is, isn't almost appropriate in that moment. But there are other seasons where fasting is really needed. Now, I would say we're in a season where fasting is needed. Not all the time. I'm not calling us to fast everything forever. But I am saying there should be a dynamic where I'm learning more and more as I walk through life that we need to be able to be those that walk with joy and sorrow together at the same time. There are so many things in life that bring us joy. There's friends and family and uh, hobbies and our homes and food and so many things bring us joy. And yet at the exact moment that those things bring us joy, there are other things that bring sorrow. Sorrow at at physical health, at what's going on in the world around us, our financial well-being, our jobs, whatever it is, there's sorrow. 
We need to learn to walk those two things. We need to be those that enter into the joy of life, but also enter into the sorrow of life. And I think part of fasting is saying, God, I am sorrowful about these things. I want to see them change. I wonder how many of us, if you would call yourself a Christian and are facing moments right now that bring sorrow into your heart, so you're finding difficult. How many of us are fasting, asking God, God, there's a, there's a dissatisfaction in my heart. I'd love to see change in this. I'd love to see you move. I recognize the only way I can see this change is by you breaking in. It's not by my hard work, it's by your grace. And so I need you to move. I wonder how many of us are doing that. Or how many of us, when we do fast, we do it out of duty. As a church, we do our Friday fast. We, we fast our lunch on Fridays or whenever you want to on your Friday. Uh, and I wonder how many of us are, began that with a heart of, yeah, what a great idea, fasting. The Bible talks about it. And now we're at the point where either we've given up well, we're doing it and we're doing it begrudgingly. We're doing it out of duty. Well, you know, the elders have said we should do this Friday fast thing. So I said, how many of us actually, it's about the heart. Jesus cares about the heart. Please don't believe that you can perform for God and he would be impressed. He cares about where your heart is at. He wants you to have a heart that's able to, to really enjoy the blessings. As the wine is poured out that God has for you, that, that your heart is the wineskin. Your life is the wineskin cultivate ways that mean you can hold the blessings of God and cultivate ways that you can see breakthrough of the blessings of God in areas that you need to see it. I don't believe that in this life everything we ask of God will be answered in the way we expect. I don't believe that if you're struggling financially, if you ask God, he will always give you money. I don't think that's how this works. But I believe that when we're in those times, when we recognize the things that we uh, bring sorrow to our hearts and we ask God to move, that it does delight the heart of God and it will draw us closer to God and we will learn contentment in whatever season we find ourselves in and we will grow in intimacy with God. And I do believe that ultimately we are blessed. If you're a Christian, you are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing, no matter what your circumstance tells you. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing here. Don't get so focused on the external, focus on the heart. And let me see this final question comes about the Sabbath. And this is a story where basically Jesus and his disciples have been out on the Sabbath and his disciples have taken some food. They've picked some grain for food. Now, uh, for the people of God, for the Jewish people, the Sabbath was a day of rest. This was a time where you didn't do any work whatsoever. And so picking food was something that would have been um, not allowed. They, they wouldn't have been encouraged to have not done that. We see that actually when they're out in the wilderness in the book of Exodus and God sends manna from heaven. He says, listen, on the Saturday or on the day before the Sabbath, Friday, whenever their Sabbath came, um, I want you to go out and on th that day, take two days worth because you do not go out and pick on the Sabbath. You rest and you trust that I am enough for you. And so then the, the disciples have picked grain. And so the Pharisees again come to Jesus. Well, look at what your guys have done. Why are you doing this? It's interesting, just a quick thing that Jesus didn't do it. His disciples did. And yet Jesus gets the blame. If you're a Christian, the way you live is connected to Jesus. People look on on the way we live and they will connect that to Christ. If we have uh, crude jokes coming out of our mouths, people will look and, and connect that to Christ. If we're those that are selfish, greedy, lustful, angry, They'll connect it to Jesus. There's a responsibility we have to reflect Jesus well. The disciples in this moment did something and Jesus was kind of, you and your disciples are doing this. So let's just be aware of that. How are you being an ambassador for Jesus at the moment? Would those around you, would your children, would your uh, wife or husband, would your parents, would your friends, would your colleagues, would your neighbours, would people on your Facebook account, whatever, would they look and say that you are reflecting Jesus well? Would there be some things they're looking at saying, wow, is Jesus really like that? We are ambassadors of Christ. We are the light of the world. And Jesus is the ultimate light. We're pointing people to him. But what I find fascinating in this is that as they come, Jesus points them back to an, a story in the Old Testament of King David. When he was on the run, uh, his, his people were hungry. And we see that they take food from the temple that they shouldn't have taken, or from the priest that they shouldn't have taken. That was only for the priest. And yet, because they were so hungry, they had it. Again, I think the point Jesus wanted to emphasize is about the internal heart. He's saying, some of you, you are following the Sabbath because you think that makes you right before God. Whereas actually, no, the Sabbath was a gift for you to recognize that God is God and he calls you to rest in him. It's not by your works you are accepted, it's by his grace. So that's why Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's, it's a gift from God for your well-being and for your growth. But what I want to just end on is this phrase that Jesus uses at the end where he says, and so the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. 
Jesus is wanting to emphasize here that in him you find ultimate rest. This is what the writer of Hebrews emphasizes in Hebrews 4 and 5 where he talks about entering into Sabbath rest. He's saying, listen, Jesus brings ultimate rest. You see, the point of the Sabbath was that God has called his people to recognize, start your week from a place of rest. Start your week understanding that it's God that does everything and we trust him and we co-labor with him. But ultimately, it's all down to God. That was the, the heart of the Sabbath. And then we see here Jesus saying, well, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the one that brings the ultimate fulfillment of Sabbath. Jesus is the one that in him we can completely and utterly rest, knowing that our acceptance before God is completely dealt with by Jesus that we're fully accepted because of Christ, his death and his resurrection. That Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath because we can now rest in this life. We can be those that are poised, that are peaceful, that are contented because we have Christ. We can lose everything else in this world and we can know contentment. We can be those that trust in the goodness of God even when everything else falls apart because of Jesus. But we also know that Jesus has won us the eternal rest. Now, lastly, when he returns, we will enter into this connectivity and this relationship with Christ in its fullness. Now, that is guaranteed for you if you're a Christian. And so when he says the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, he's wanting to emphasize here, look to Jesus and you will find rest. That's why he stands up in the Gospels and he says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Some of us think it's our responsibility to rest. Now, it is physically emotionally, mentally, we must ensure that we are a people of rest. In times like this, I wonder how many of us cancelled holidays that we had planned. How many of us are working actually more hours than we were before? Friends, look after yourselves. Rest. But ultimately know that it's in Jesus we find true rest. We can rest before God. We don't need to strive. We don't need to toil. We don't need to perform. We can know total acceptance because of Jesus, because Jesus is fully accepted by the Father. Those of us that have our faith in Christ, we are now fully accepted by the Father. Because Jesus was able to be led by the Spirit, if we are in Christ, we're able to be led by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, which means we can be those that rest, knowing that God is at work in our hearts. Jesus cares about the heart. He's not worried about the external. It's from the heart that your external starts to change. Your externals don't change your heart. You can try to be good, you can try to be kind, you can try to be generous, but actually unless your heart is those things and growing in those things, ultimately it won't impact. If your heart is generous, your lifestyle will be a generous lifestyle. If your heart is full of God's kindness, the fruit of the Spirit, then you will have a lifestyle that is kind. If your heart is full of joy, you'll have a lifestyle of joy. Friends, let's spend time focusing in on the internal and let Jesus do a deep work in us. Understanding that he came for the sinners, not the righteous, that was all of us. And the invitation is we can come and recline at the table with him, knowing acceptance before God. That he is the God that brings new wine, he's the, he's the bridegroom, he's the one that brings joy and, and closeness to him, and we need to learn to walk joy and sorrow, and those things that bring sorrow, let's bring them to God. Let's ask God to change them, trusting in his power and in his might. And then let's understand that Jesus is the place we can find total and utter and full rest. We can know rest in this life, but we can be expectant of the eternal rest that Jesus has won for us. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you know each one of us more than we know ourselves. I thank you that you are the one that cares completely about us. That Lord, you you know and you care. And I just pray, God, help us to not perform. Help us to not feel that we need to be things or act in certain ways around you, can we just know, Lord Jesus, that you're calling us to focus in on our heart, to let you do work on our heart. Pray for those that don't know you. Lord, would they hear your invitation of follow me today? Lord, would they come and recline at the table with you? Would they come and rest with you? Lord Jesus, would you help them to know your love, your acceptance, your grace, I pray. Lord, I pray for those that do know you, for your church. Help us, O oh God, to continue to focus in on the internal, on ensuring that our hearts are right before you, keeping ourselves in the love of God, rather than feeling like we need to be something or live out any expectations that we ourselves have on us or others have on us. God, would we be able to be poised and at peace, trusting and following you all the days of our lives. Help us, we ask God. Reveal to us, even now, Jesus, those areas of our hearts that you want to do work on. Change us, Lord Jesus. Grow us, we pray, and draw us ever closer to you. 
Help us to live in the rest that you've won for us with soft hearts, bringing our weariness and our anxiety to you because we know you care. In your name. Amen. There's still time to sign up to our Alpha course that's happening tomorrow. Uh, we'd love to see you there if you are thinking about faith or new to faith. If you've got questions about faith, um, it'd be great for you to join in. There's till, still time to sign up uh, using the link below. If you want to watch a taster session, also use the link below to see what it's about uh, if you want to before you sign up. It's been great to have you here this morning and we really hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. God bless and see you next week.